1967. And uh, we ha have here my longtime friend uh, and famous uh, Lithuanian dissident, on, at that time it was dissident on Thomas Kerlitzkis. <laughs> And in 1977, he helped me to uh, write uh, one of the first articles, actually, that appeared in the Western press about the uh, Lithuanian national movement. And that article was called uh, Ghost, Ghost in the Machine. And it appeared in the Financial Times. And. Uh, at that time, there was some doubt in the West as to whether there really was a national movement in Lithuania. So, uh, in a way, it helped to make people in the West aware that there was such a movement and that not everything was, was accepted. Well, the uh, subject for today is the uh, situation in Russia currently. And just as in those years uh, everything looked calm in the Soviet Union, a lot was happening under the surface, uh, I think it's fair to say that in Russia today, despite the appearance of calm, a great deal is happening under the surface. And in fact, last December, we got the first uh, indication that uh, the Putin regime is not as secure as uh, many had believed because there began to be mass demonstrations against the corruption and the criminality. I think it's the tragic fate really of Russia that the, the, the gangsterism of communism uh, was replaced by ordinary gangsterism the gangsterism without an ideology, because the, the process that took place in the 20 years since the fall of, of communism witnessed the change in the economic system, but it didn't include the creation of a society based on law. And without uh, a legal framework, without the importance of genuine democratic institutions being stressed by the society, and without a change in the consciousness of people, uh, it was inevitable that such a massive change from communism to capitalism in such a huge country would result in uh, the criminalization, basically, of the entire country. The uh, privatization in Russia was described as the largest peaceful transfer of property in human history. Now, I don't know if there are other transfers of property that were comparable, but it's certainly a very plausible claim. The entire industrial plant of the former Soviet Union, which was built through the combined efforts of the entire population, was put in private hands. And it was not particularly important in whose hands. Uh, and under those circumstances, the persons with corrupt connections, the persons who had been involved with uh, the criminal world in Russia, and the Russian officials themselves were able to appropriate the huge wealth of a former superpower. And that's why we had a very paradoxical situation in Russia. The productivity of the country fell. In fact, uh, the gross national product in Russia was cut in half. This didn't happen even under Nazi occupation. But yet at the same time, as the standard of living fell, as many people uh, literally were forced to raise their own food because they weren't being paid, and uh, millions of people died prematurely, uh, as a result of disease, suicide, accidents, murder, or just general psychological despair, Russia suddenly had more millionaires and billionaires than any country in the world. Uh, Moscow became one of the world's most expensive cities. The market for 
uh, conspicuous consumption or luxury goods uh, <clears throat> burgeoned in Russia with the result that there was just a huge difference between the very, very rich and the hopelessly poor. In fact, one figure about the 1990s that was uh, a very shocking and very relevant is that Russia during the 1990s recorded uh, 6 million surplus deaths. Now the term surplus deaths is a term that's used by demographers or population experts. Surplus deaths are those deaths that could not have, it doesn't mean that 6 million people were taken out and murdered. It means that, that 6 million people, there were 6 million deaths that could not have been predicted on the basis of pre-existing trends. In other words, the trend lines changed and Russia became a more lethal country. In fact, it began to experience the death rates of a country at war. And the, uh, of course, the discontent with uh, the Yeltsin regime under these circumstances became enormous. And by 1999, it was clear that Yeltsin had no support in the country. Public opinion polls showed that he was supported by only 2% of the, of the population. Vladimir Putin, who had just been named the prime minister, uh, was also supported as a potential candidate for president by 2%. Now, according to sociologists, in any survey, 6% of the respondents don't understand the question. So if someone is supported by 2%, we can assume that practically there's no support at all. How under these circumstances did Putin become the leader of Russia? And who was he really? He had never run for office. He was the head of the FSB. The FSB is the successor organization to the KGB. Uh, he had a reputation for corruption in St. Petersburg, where he was the deputy mayor. And also, uh, in a country where uh, there were some well-known political figures, no one had ever heard of him. He was completely unknown. But uh, shortly after he became prime minister, strange things began happening in Moscow. There began to be rumors that there would be some type of provocation. Something would happen to change the course of the, elect the coming election because new elections for president were inevitable. They were going to take place in the year 2000. The candidates who were running for president or, or who demonstrated their interest in, in succeeding Yeltsin as president made clear that they were going to investigate the massive corruption that had existed under Yeltsin. And since the epicenter of corruption in Russia at the time was not <clears throat> Was, was Yeltsin himself and his, the members, and in particular the members of his family, all the people in the Yeltsin entourage had reason to be very much afraid. They had to be afraid not only of, a, of arrest, but uh, given the way in which scores are settled in Russia and given the way in which the great fortunes in the country were built, they could not even be sure of the security of their lives. Well, in September 1999, uh, explosions took place in uh, four apartment buildings in the town of Guinox, which is in, we don't have a map here, but it's in Dagestan, in the northern Caucasus. <laughs> no, it's, that's not me, that's the, uh, that's the pen. The, the, the area was on the outskirts of Riazan, uh, 
and the building was located here, not at the top of the hill. And then there was another building here. Okay? The point is that <coughs> this is where the bomb was placed. And <coughs> there were 400 people, 450 people lived in this building, 400 or so in this building. And if the bomb had gone off, because of the way in which it was placed, the, the, the remains of the bomb would have hit this building with the force of an avalanche and taken it as well. So there would have been 800 people killed. 800 or 900, in addition to the 300 that were murdered. The day after the Riazan incident, uh, Russian forces began bombing Chechnya as if it was timed perfectly so that there would be this, this, this horrifying atrocity and then the revenge of the Russians against those who were being accused of the atrocity. Uh, in any case, uh, for reasons that are hard to understand, the, the world the world press, uh, the world uh, journalists and diplomats and officials did not react to the events in Riazan. And the Russian election campaign continued and it was somehow forgotten. Not quite forgotten. Everybody was somehow aware of it, but no one wanted to talk about it. And uh, to this day, it exists just below the surface in Russia as a reminder of how Putin came to power. Uh, I, I personally am one of those who, I testified before the US Congress and I, 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 I presented what I consider to be the evidence that Putin came to power through an act of terror directed against his own people. But uh, Putin's uh, strange background and the strange events that, that, that led to his becoming Russian president were quickly forgotten in Russia because Russia embarked on a huge economic boom. During the 1990s, during all these years that uh, the population was dying, was dying in many cases, in which uh, criminals were taking over the economy. Nonetheless, the socialist, the communist economy was being broken down and capitalist economic institutions were being created. And then what happened to, after Putin became president? The price of raw materials suddenly began going way up. It had been, at one point, under uh, Yeltsin, the price of oil was $9 a barrel. It reached nine, touched $9 a barrel at one point. Under Putin, it reached $147 a barrel. And what happened to, to oil happened to, to all other commodities as well, not just oil. It happened to gas, rare metals, uh, gold, timber. And Russia was the number one beneficiary of the world boom in commodities. And for the first time, uh, and it must be said also, to, in, you know, <clears throat> in the name of objectivity, that Putin high, it picked competent, very competent economic managers who did not allow uh, this newfound wealth to create massive inflation. And Russia began to, to really boom economically. Uh, the, the standard of living uh, the, well, let's put the, the level, the poverty level instead of, uh, even by, uh, by by European standards fell from something like, I don't have the precise figure, I think it was 28% to 13% so he, the, 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 a lot of poverty was eliminated uh, the, uh, the gross national product increased six times 
although from a very low, a very low level, but it still increased dramatically. And you know, I had been going to Russia for many years, and I had always thought of Russia as a very poor country. But for the first time, it began to look prosperous. There began to be a middle class. And Russians forgave Putin everything. They forgave him the lawlessness. They forgave him the corruption. Because they, were, they, they began to see that every year they were living better. And they had waited decades for that to happen. Uh, <clears throat> but nothing goes on forever. Putin did not want to give up power. And after two terms in office, in 2008, he had to decide what to do. To abandon the Constitution, as well as the pretense of any type of democratic government in Russia, or to step aside. His solution was to uh, step aside, but put in his place someone who was a completely dependent puppet, and that was Dmitry Medvedev. Medvedev became president from 2008 to 2012. His first act was to appoint Putin prime minister, and all real power was retained by Putin. And then in 2012, Medvedev announced he was stepping aside, and Putin would run for president again. And during his time in office, he talked about the, ni the legal nihilism in Russia, although he did nothing to correct it, and the, 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 uh, the war, the, the need to fight corruption. He, he identified himself with the need to fight corruption, although corruption, you know, according to international rankings, Russia went from 64th in honesty in, the, uh, in, uh, in 2000 to 154th uh, on a level with countries like the Central African Republic. It, but nonetheless, and Medvedev said that he was fighting corruption. And I had one personal uh, example of his corruption fighting because I wrote a book, my second book is called Darkness at Dawn, The Rise of the Russian Criminal State. And in that book, I wrote about a bar in Moscow called The Hungry Duck, which was run by a Canadian. And this bar was very famous because of this Canadian was, was a great innovator. He had lots of creative ideas. And one of his ideas was called Ladies' Night. Ladies' Night was when all women were allowed free, in free, no men. They were free to drink as much as they want, no charge for the, for the liquor. And at 10 o'clock, after this had been going on for about three hours, Men were let in, but they had to pay fantastic, you know, admissions fees. And uh, a lot of the, the women at that day, in keeping with the atmosphere there, actually, you know, danced on the bar on the bar counter. And the Hungry Duck became famous in Moscow because many of the girls who did that also took off their clothes. Now, Doug Steele insisted to me that he never asked anyone to take off their clothes. But he never did anything to prevent it either. And this reputation attracted the uh, guys from the FSB and from the police. And so what you had at the Hungry Duck were foreigners who had a lot of money, wealthy Russians, and FSB agents and agents from the MVD. Now, why am I telling you all this story? Because one of the people that I met through Doug was a habitué of the, of the uh, hungry duck by the name of Timothy, whose job was to check on the banking activities of uh, on the activities of the of banking officials for the police. That was his job. He was phenomenal bribe taker, of course, and he had a mistress who was a, a stripper, and Doug told me that he spent four million dollars on her before she dumped him. Well, years pass, Medvedev becomes president of Russia, and he announces that he is launching this anti-corruption campaign. I came back to, uh, to Moscow, and I saw Doug Steele, and he said, listen, 
Uh, <clears throat> you'll never guess who Medvedev has put in charge of the anti-corruption campaign. And I said, who? And he said, Timothy. I said, you've got to be kidding. kidding. The one who spent $4 million on that stripper? And he said, that's right. He's the head of the anti-corruption campaign. <laughs> so at that point, I understood that there was not going to be any kind of war against corruption under the leadership of this guy. And that the whole thing was actually just a kind of joke. It was just a kind of pantomime. And the only thing that Medvedev did during his presidency was that he increased the term of president from four years to six years. So it meant that when Putin became president again, he, under the Constitution, he could run for two six-year terms consecutively. Since he had never really given up power, that meant he would, have been in, he would be in power for 24, a total of 24 years. And people in Moscow began to calculate how old they would be when uh, Putin finally left office. And many of them realized that, that they had no future in the country because the system that Putin had created, even though it, there was prosperity, was based on cronyism and corruption. And a lot of the people in positions of power were appointing their own children. And it was clear that for someone who was ambitious or who wanted to make a career or who wanted to have a future, there was no future. And finally, December 4th of last year, they, the president, the, the elections to parliament were held. And those elections were completely falsified. There were, and the evidence of the, of the falsification was captured on uh, mobile phones and put on YouTube, and the whole country became aware of it. And that sparked the first demonstrations. And uh, in December, the demonstrations grew, and finally, they reached about 100,000 persons. Now, those, are the, those were the largest demonstrations in Moscow since the fall of the Soviet Union. And they, they did shock the, the, the Putin leadership. And the Putin leadership has every reason to be shocked because there have been many other crimes that have been committed during these years that Putin has been in, in, in power. For example, it was undoubtedly Putin who gave the order in 2002 to flood the, the theater at Dubrovka with poison gas at a time when it was captured by terrorists, with the result that hundreds of hostages died. And it, must, and it had to be Putin who gave the order to open fire on the school gymnasium in Bislan, where there were 900 hostages, most of them children, who were, who were then attacked with flamethrowers and grenade launchers, and many of them simply burned alive. All of those questions need to be raised and will be raised if Putin ever loses power. And of course, the biggest question of all is the apartment bombings. Who planned them? And why is it that FSB agents were caught putting a bomb in the basement of a building in Riazan? So in order to prevent that from happening, there have been a whole series of repressive laws that have been passed in recent months. The point is to try to, the concessions were made in the immediate aftermath of the demonstrations. Uh, for example, Russia has no independent election of governors, even though it describes itself as a federation. The, the, the governors are appointed. Now, uh, provisions have been made for the for the election of governors. Uh, before, it was very difficult for independent political parties to register. Those rules have been liberalized. Uh, but at the same time as those changes were made to appease the democratic movement in the country, uh, efforts were made to uh, render them meaningless. For example, in the case of political parties, it's easier to form a political party now so you can have more political parties. But they cannot form electoral coalitions, so it's, in, it's, it's, it's not possible to have a unified political bloc. So people will have to, to, to choose between you know, 
10 to 20 parties, many of which they don't recognize and don't, don't understand, and whose positions they don't understand. The election of government, governors uh, is only going ahead uh, with the help of a filter. Local legislatures, which are under the control of the, low, of the, of the, the present ruling party, have to approve candidates for governors, for governor, which is a real impediment, a real block in the case of, of many regions in Russia. At the same time, there are, uh, fines have been increased uh, to astronomical figures for participating in unsanctioned meetings. Slander has become a criminal offense. So therefore, if you say something that the, that the authorities find slanderous, uh, or that they interpret as slanderous, you can, you can, be, you can, be, put in, you can be put in prison. And there's a new law on treason, which expands the understanding of treason and makes it possible for them to dis consider treason anything they like. It's a little bit like the Soviet days when they had two articles, anti-Soviet slander and anti-Soviet agitation, which, with which they kept the whole country under control. Because people who spoke out or who circulated information under the Soviet regime could be charged under those, under those articles. So the situation now is very unstable, and I'll conclude with this. The, uh, the regime is losing legitimacy. The, the patience at, that people showed at a time when the economy was rising, improving rapidly, has run out, and now people are bothered by the lawlessness, by the criminality, and by the fact that they have no choice. Uh, during these years, the middle class has grown up in Russia that, w that is, is more westernized than, uh, than the members of the previous generation, and which wants to have um, democratic European Western freedoms and opportunities. At the same time, the regime is doing everything possible to limit the opposition. And this may only have the effect of making the opposition more determined and driving at least a part of the opposition into violent activities. And finally, the situation is, is dangerous because uh, many of the people who are protesting against Putin's rule are democratic, are, have democratic mentalities. They are democratic in their thinking and in their orientation. But there are also Russian nationalists and, and uh, uh, actually communists, people who say that the Soviet Union was a lost paradise where everyone had free medicine and, and uh, free education and, this, and the Soviet system should be restored and Russia should reassert its control over the former Soviet republics. Sometimes they exclude the Baltics from that, but not always. So, uh, right now the, 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 the situation is unstable. What Russia needs, and what I personally have argued for, is a, a Russian version of the South African Commission on Truth and Reconciliation. A complete, complete honesty about the communist past, commemoration of the victims who suffered, historical honesty about what happened, and historical honesty also about the post-communist period and, truthful, and a truthful investigation of the apartment bombings of the terrorist acts uh, as a preparation for a new constitution, genuine uh, establishment of the separation of powers. Without those steps, the danger is that given Russia's traditions, Oh, one, one corrupt regime may be replaced by something that's not better and conceivably even worse. So uh, with that, I, th I think I've probably gone well beyond the 30 minutes that I was supposed to uh, speak, but I hope we have some, we probably have time for questions. So if you